Well, good afternoon. I'm here to give an update on COVID-19 and specifically an update on where we are with the reemployment program and uh, the compensation that we've uh, been, been paying out and, and what we're going to do, continue to do going forward. Uh, first, um, what have we been doing with the plan from the very beginning? Protect the vulnerable, increase testing, promote social distancing, support hospitals, protect healthcare workers, and then obviously prevent introduction from outside the state. So we're going to continue to be doing that as we go forward. Uh, nothing changes. The contours of that obviously will, will, will shift a little bit, uh, but those are still key priorities as we go forward. And we are now in phase one in the state of Florida, other than our three southeastern Florida counties that have been uh, that have had to deal with a, a little bit more significant epidemic. Uh, and so this was something where we received input from a wide cross-section of people across the state, including many of our great physicians. We did have a reopened Florida task force that cr created a number of great recommendations. I obviously considered that report when we uh, devised the phase one. And so there's going to be a lot of similarities to where we are now. Schools are going to remain on distance learning. Of course, we're going to continue to have senior living facilities uh, be cordoned off and protected. Uh, but you do see things, and then some of the things like the bars are going to remain closed. But you are going to see changes with elective surgeries being able to resume today. That's very important for people. Elective does not mean not necessary. It just means when you schedule it, uh, because we have so much hospital capacity, there wasn't any reason to keep that uh, prohibition in place. And so I think that that'll be good for folks. We also are now doing retail, 25% of indoor capacity. Again, we've had a lot of retail operating, Home Depot, Walmart, all those places. Uh, so this is any of the retail beyond that. Many of those stores were operating with curbside pickup. Uh, this will allow uh, limited capacity indoors. And then the same with restaurants. Many of them have been doing carry out and take out. Uh, they now can do the outdoor seating with the appropriate spacing and then indoors at 25% capacity. So this is a measured step. This clearly isn't the flipping on a, a switch, uh, but I think as we go, we're gonna continue to be very thoughtful about it. And, uh, and I think that's what most Floridians expect. Of course, vulnerable individuals uh, should avoid close contact with people outside the home. These are people 65 and plus, uh, people with significant underlying medical conditions. I was at Halifax Hospital yesterday talking about the elective surgeries. One of the doctors there has treated COVID patients, says he is not, that he had not had a single healthy individual um, under the age of 50 end up on a ventilator throughout this whole time. So we know that this disease affects some groups more than others. Uh, so certainly when you're looking at the nursing homes, long-term care facilities, but then even beyond that, we wanna make sure we're pro uh, doing the appropriate social distancing with those individuals. Uh, of course, we're still uh, no large groups uh, throughout the state of Florida, and um, you, know, you should always be considering uh, social distance as you're going about uh, your, your work or if you're in public. Uh, you know, we've been talking about facts versus fear, just making sure that we're data driven, that we're focusing on what actually is the truth and not allowing things to get carried away. And I just think it's, you know, we're Duval County in mid-April um, allowed uh, recreational access to its beaches. Uh, this, for some reason, drew the attention of a lot of folks in the national media. They were saying that this was a really bad thing. Of course, you look at the photo that's used, it's like, get that lens right in that area so that it looks like there's so many people crowded out there. Um, so you had that, you had a lot of negative things said about the people of Northeast Florida uh, on the internet and in some of these articles. And the thought was, okay, things are are going to be just so bad there. They're not social distancing. This is going to cause, cause problems. And so, you know, this was 17 days ago, but I, before we talk about the facts, local media in Northeast Florida did a great job. They showed how the pictures were misleading. They showed how, you know, if you look at it, basically the chance of you acquiring it there is dramatically lower than it would be at Costco. And so that brought, I think, some much needed perspective to this. But we're now 17 days later. And so I think we should ask, what has happened? I mean, you had this, this frenzy. Uh, here we are. So let's look at what's happened. Hospitalizations in du Duval County, April 16th to May 3rd, down 28% uh, since mid-April. ICU hospitalizations in Duval County, down 50% 
since mid-April. Ventilator use in Duval County, down 32% since mid-April. New case positivity, I mean, really in the last two weeks, you've only had one time where it was even over 5%. There's places around this country that would kill to just get to 10%. And many of the times the cases are one or 2% of the total tests are coming back positive. And so I think we know the facts. The facts are that since this has happened, hospitalizations, ICU, rate of positivity, ventilators, that has all declined. Those people were wrong and the folks in Duval County behaved appropriately. Uh, I think apologies can be sent to City of Jacksonville, attention Mayor Curry. You may wanna CC the mayors of Neptune Beach, Jacksonville Beach, and Atlantic Beach, but I won't hold my breath on that happening. Now, safe, smart, step-by-step -step is how we're going, methodical, data-driven, working with the business, medical community, obviously education, very important. So reemployment assistance. So just a little bit of background on kind of you know, what has happened. The, the system that Florida has is this Connect system. It was contracted for in March of 2011. Uh, there was a total, they paid a firm 40 million for it, but then the total amount of costs were 77.9 million. Their, the contract was amended 14 different times during this. Um, and there were a bunch of issues when this thing was launched. Now those issues, are not necessarily the same issues that cause the problems here. This is a capacity issue, and that just never seemed to be something that people had paid a, a lot of attention to. Um, so, so that's kind of you know where we were with this. Um, and if you look at the different costs, there's a lot of money that went into this. And uh, this is going back, looking, I've talked to different people in the legislature, I've talked to citizens and taxpayers. People want an accounting about why this much, because it's one thing to not have a good system if you go on the cheap or whatever, but to pay that much money and then all the problems we've had to deal with, you know, it's a big problem. And so uh, I am going to be uh, directing the uh, inspector general uh, to do an investigation into how the Connect system was, was paid for, the different uh, amendments to the contract, and go through that whole thing so that we get uh, the, the results about that, because I think that that's something that's very important for the people of Florida to know. So we had a situation where this thing just wasn't gonna cut it. And we had a lot of decision points early, because it was pretty clear, you know, as we got into the end of March, it, this thing just, it just wasn't gonna cut it. So we looked into, do you just create a new website? And, and try to do it that way. The problem with that would have been, it would have taken 30 days just for the company to survey and try to figure out what needed to be done. We did not have just 30 days to sit around. We thought about maybe just doing it by hand and having these people in, you know, and I ended up surging people in. We thought about maybe you do that. The problem is, is that there's so many different databases that need to be pinged on this that it probably would have taken uh, months and months to be able to do that. So we had to figure out what to do, and, and, and the, the, the basic uh, decision was, you're gonna have to rebuild some of this architecture. So we had to get engineers in there, understand the thing was flawed, do whatever needed to be due to increase the capacity, get rid of some of the bad code, uh, clean out a lot of the things that had cluttered the system. So, so that, was, that was the decision point that was made. And so obviously we had a situation where one challenge was people couldn't even access the system. You had times where this thing was down 50% of the time, 60, 70. I think at one point it may have been down 80 or 90% of the time. Well, these are people who were on trying to get the system. They had just lost their jobs. They don't know when the next paycheck's coming. And so this created a huge, huge source of angst uh, with the public. Uh, so we wanted to, we had to figure out, okay, people need to be able to submit a claim. Uh, how that's processed on Connect, we'll obviously have to build that, but they gotta be able to submit a claim. Uh, so there was a mobile website that was stood up that, that was functional. Uh, we had to build an adapter to transfer data from the new mobile site uh, to Connect. 
uh, so that you would be able to actually process what people were doing. We also created a paper application because some folks didn't have access to the internet anyways, but even those that were and they couldn't get on, they needed an outlet. So we had FedEx agree to print and mail the applications to the state of Florida. And in I think we got over 100,000, 150,000 via the paper route. Um, we also offered additional areas to pick up or submit applications through Career Source Florida and local governments. So this is, okay, how do you troubleshoot it? Uh, this is a way at least let them submit the information. Um, one of the things I was worried about uh, when we, when we kind of got into this, uh, the DEO thought the website was good, so their more concern was about being uh, empty-handed, not having enough people there. So I said, you got to have people that can answer the phone because they just didn't have enough. And it, they didn't do it right away. Once I got John Satter in there, very quickly, uh, we went from uh, 50 to 75 to 2,000 call center agents. And uh, the training for call center uh, folks before we made changes, it took them three weeks just to train one person to take phone calls. So when DEO came to me and said that, I said, that's unacceptable. What are you going to do, train for three weeks? So John put in a 24-hour training, and then we were able to be able to get people there um, for the PIN and then two days for the call center. Uh, so that's allowed us to really beef that up. But that's just important because you know that, and I'm going to go through some of the statistics about the, the, the vast difference in calls now versus just a few months ago. Obviously, part of reemployment is that uh, you have to search for a job. So if you lose a job under normal circumstances, you are not allowed to simply just apply for reemployment. You actually have to show that you're searching for a different job. You got to make a certain number of job searches. So that takes time and it basically delays. You probably not, wouldn't even be able to apply for two weeks. Well, we thought that in this circumstance, uh, we wanted to get the money out as quickly as possible. We knew there weren't a lot of jobs necessarily coming online, uh, so, so I suspended the work search requirements uh, to be able to allow people to submit the application so we can get it in the system. There's also um, the problem of because the Connect system was, was so faulty, people couldn't get up, uh, we had to say, okay, we're going to automatically recertify you for the two weeks saying you're unemployed because we understand certainly for the next however many weeks that's likely to continue to be the case. And so that took some pressure off the system uh, that would have continued to, I think, weigh it down. So that was helpful. Uh, but we also added because there was such a need for capacity, uh, we had folks from the state government driving through the night when, when the initial crash occurred, bringing additional servers. They, they've now brought a total of 72 servers uh, so that they could boost uh, the number of concurrent users. You go back January, February, you're looking at hundreds, maybe thousands who would be on the site. Well, now we're in a situation where you have 100, 150,000 people trying to get on the site. So you needed to find a way to do more capacity. They've also, uh, the engineers added sophisticated hardware. So there's a new SAN system that has increased the transfer speeds. I mean, this was so slow. So they've been able to speed it up. Um, and then they've made huge amounts of optimizations to the software to be able to uh, make the system more stable and, and, and increase its performance. That has been very, very difficult. We have people working through the night. What they were doing a lot of times is doing it between midnight and 6 a.m. They've taken advantage of the weekends to make some changes and to focus on processing, which is uh, something that's, that's very, very important. Obviously, one challenge was, yes, we, we waived all this stuff, and so under normal circumstances, it takes two weeks before you apply, then another three weeks before you get paid. Here, we were in a crisis situation. We wanted to do it as quickly as possible, uh, and so you know, we did suspend the waiting week, uh, but then we brought in 2,000 agency employees from different agencies to come in and supplement these efforts. So that may be something like putting the paper applications into Connect. Uh, it may be doing some of the verification, but they've had an all hands on deck approach. And really we've never seen anything like that in state government. And part of it, I wanted to make it all hands on deck, but you really have to have a workforce that would respond to it. And the, and the state workforce really responded to it. I think they all felt that, that we needed to do whatever we could to get more money out. Um, and of course there was 
all the hardware improvements to the Connect system that's been done uh, over these many weeks uh, have been really significant. It's required a lot of brain power, and the people that have been involved in that, I think, have done a, done a really, really good job under very difficult circumstances because this is not a simple architecture. This is a, a very convoluted architecture. There had been a lot of data that had been built up over the last decade that was slowing down the system. So they're getting data out, they're changing code, they're doing all these things. And, um, and I'll show you the results, but I think, uh, I think it's been, been good. One of the other problems with getting paid is even if you submit on Connect and even if the state processes it fine, it has to ping certain federal databases, like the Social Security database. So you have to have a valid Social Security number. What was happening was that was going through the federal Social Security check, and they were doing maybe a 1,000 checks a day. Well, obviously, when you have hundreds and hundreds of thousands, that is just not going to cut it. So we were able to say, hey, we have databases in the state of Florida, highway safety motor vehicles. They could verify this much quicker than the federal system. So we brought in the highway safety motor vehicle to verify the social security numbers. And so we'll see the number of claims that have now been able to move, been move out. We would not have been able to do that had we not been able to do the highway safety motor vehicle verification. So that removed uh, a bottleneck uh, and has allowed more people to be, be, be paid. But that required us to show the Department of Labor that we had the data and we could do the proper verifications. So obviously, we, you know, we've had a lot of stuff. This has been an ongoing, it's, probably, it's been the number one thing we've worked on other than health uh, since this all started. Once we got into this uh, situation where you started to see the economy stop, uh, I knew that there was gonna be a situation where people weren't gonna be able to, to get a job. So we suspended that uh, immediately. Connect, after very little uptick, started, started crashing. And that was really just the tip of the iceberg at the third week of March. You started to see way more uh, after that. Uh, we suspended the one week waiting period. Uh, we did make the paper applications available. Uh, we did the chat bot at floridajobs.org because we wanted to get people uh, frequently answered questions. We did bring the state employees, over 2,000 additional employees, to be able to have an all-hands-on-deck hand, approach. By April 4th, we had had a 72 uh, new servers, uh, which, was, uh, which was helpful. Uh, we had career source and local government helping us get people applications. FedEx, of course, as I've mentioned, uh, the mobile application online, which is uh, a faster option for Floridians to file a claim. And then on April 15th, Secretary Satter took the helm and was able to bring to fruition some of the things that we had wanted to be there earlier, like an expanded call center. And, and that was something that was really, really important. When we were told that people were hung up in the system because they couldn't get on to certify their weeks, uh, I issued executive order to suspend that uh, so that they would be able uh, to get paid. And then, of course, all the hardware upgrades that DEO made, that was done a, a, a lot. Uh, they've had different people, engineers across the state of Florida and the government come in in different agencies to help out. Uh, new dashboard to show the claims being processed. Uh, the most claims submitted, there's a lot of duplicates, but when you get down uh, from that, you kind of get the, what are the verified claims and how many have been processed is kind of what we're looking at. Uh, and so we have a lot of call center staff over the last, uh, last couple of weeks. We're even using some buildings in Florida State uh, to be able to do the paper applications of course, highway safety, as I mentioned. And um, you know, we have five call centers now up and running in the state of Florida just for reemployment assistance. So that's the most we've ever had uh, by far. Uh, the state employees that we've surged, they've already done 100,000 processing of paper applications. And so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's something that's a good thing. Uh, April 27th, we claimed the weeks for Floridians automatically. What happened is once you started getting into late April, the system was running a little bit better. So people were going on and claiming their weeks anyways. So a lot of them were able to do that, and, uh, and, but the ones we weren't, we did. Now, the pandemic unemployment assistance claim application was launched April 29th. That's for people who don't qualify for reemployment assistance or the federal share of the unemployment. And so that just got that, those rules recently from the federal government, so that's gonna be launching. John can talk a little bit about that. Obviously, we're doing in phase one, extended the waiver for work search requirements, and then um, 
you know, we're now looking to be able to adjust the date they tried to apply uh, because if you couldn't get on for a week, you were unemployed that week and that that should count in your favor. So here's just kind of how the numbers have shaken out. So if you look just over the last five years, obviously this is an unprecedented spike in reemployment applications. You had a little bit of a spike uh, after Hurricane Irma, uh, but nothing on, on this level. It's been a uh, um, massive, and I think even if you were to do the Great Recession, Great Recession would, of course, be higher than Hurricane Irma, but it would not, um, it would not reach that weekly spike as quickly as COVID-19 has done. Average number of claims weekly, if you look at the last few years, you're looking at under 10,000 every year. Now, the 58,570 that we have as a weekly average in Florida for 2020, that counts January and February, where it was very low. So if you were to look at just mid-March until the present, that number, that 58,000, would be even higher. Call center stats. So you look, very modest call center for the last five years, and then all of a sudden it goes up to millions and millions of calls. It has gone down because I think the, the processing has gotten better and so people are starting to see the money going, but that's a huge, huge spike there to where the week of April 4th, there were 3,807,000 calls submitted into the call center. And if you look total weekly calls, almost nothing in early March before the pandemic really hit. And then as you see, it goes up. And then really, I think that beginning of April was when we were kind of in a situation where people were, were really looking for answers. The system had been having problems. And then I think as you've seen, as, as the system has gotten better, uh, the calls, they're still significant, uh, but they have become uh, a little less so. And that's just calls per year. So the entire years preceding this, uh, this is what we've done just in the past Really, 90% of that's just going to be in the past six or seven weeks. But even just through the beginning of May, you're way above where we've been in recent years just for the year. So that's a, that's a big, big deal. Number of claims. So if you look uh, at the processing, so these are the number of claims that have been processed now in the state of Florida. Uh, we probably have about, uh, we think, about 900,000-ish verified claims that, that, that need to be processed. There's a lot that are duplicate. I think John can kind of go and explain, but when, if you look at just every claim submitted, there's people that have submitted paper, connect, and PEGA. Uh, and so when you kind of filter that, you're looking at 711,000. There's still a couple hundred thousand that, that need to be processed. But I think if you see kind of the jump that you've seen in terms of the increase, that's a function of Having the state employees in a groove, that's a function of having major architectural changes made by engineers to the system to be able to process uh, these claims in a way that is, uh, that, is, um, uh, that is effective. And so the beginning part of this, very little. Uh, it was a slow system. A lot of times it wasn't even up. And then they've really been able uh, to increase it. And, and John has been a big part of that with his leadership of trying to get this thing on track. Uh, and then we'll see, show you kind of the, how, it, how it's worked with the payments. So if you look at those two spikes, so it was uh, the previous weekend before this one, there was um, almost 400,000 made over the weekend. And then last weekend, there was uh, 456,000 in that period. The other times are still getting close to 100,000 once the system got a little bit better, which if you're doing 100,000 in a day, that's a pretty good clip. But what's happening over the weekend is they're, they're taking the connect down from the public. You still have PEGA, still have the ability to apply, uh, but they're taking it, they're making additional upgrades as needed as we see the different bugs that are there, and then they just process all day long, put these checks through. And the fewer people that are on the system, the quicker the processing goes. And so that's why you've been able to be able to see that um, over the last two weeks. But if you're in a situation where you're making you know, 50, 100,000 payments a day, well, that's a, you could really make a chunk, get, get a chunk. But those weekends, I think, have been very helpful in getting checks out, getting money out to people. Because at the end of the day, if they see the money showing up, that is going to be important economically, but it's also just going to be important for peace of mind because they were wondering, you know, when is this, when is this going to happen? So I think that they've done a good job of, of doing that. 
So our goal is to continue to process the new claims as quickly as possible. Now, we are in phase one of the reopening. We're going to be very measured on that, but I, my hope is, is that we're going to be able to get to a situation uh, where these folks are going to be able to have to go back to their jobs and, and be able to work again. But that's not going to happen overnight. And so the reemployment program is going to continue to be a top priority. Uh, they may, and John can tell you a little bit more, you know, they may be doing even more stuff this coming weekend uh, and processing like they have. Uh, but I think what you've seen is particularly over the last 10 to 10 to 14 days, you know, you've started to see really significant volume of payments going out. And it's really taken a, a major overhaul uh, behind the scenes with the architecture uh, of this system done. So there's a lot of engineers in the state of Florida who worked very hard, but I think looking back, to have tried to do a new website or to have tried to just say we're going to do it maybe manually when you still need all these databases, this was the, probably the quickest way given the, the hand we were dealt. And, and I think the folks at DEO um, you know, have done a good job. It's not over. we got to do even better. And they're working around the clock to do it because we know that there's going to continue to be more claims. Uh, but I think the processing that has been done, uh, the numbers are starting uh, to look much better. And I think you're seeing that out in the public with people who have now been paid. John, they'll email John directly, and I think he can tell you that um, the, the emails he was getting three weeks ago versus now, that the people are appreciative of what you've done. And, and there's obviously some folks out there. There's questions that people have asked about, hey, I applied in mid-March and I still haven't gotten paid. And John can go into a little more details, but if that's the case, you would have been processed by now because they process enough. So what, some reasons you wouldn't be processed, incomplete application, incorrect social security number, potentially not eligible for the reemployment assistance. Uh, there is going to be the PUA, which, we'll, uh, which John can talk about uh, if people are interested in that. That will be coming out soon. But when, when the agency sees folks uh, who get quoted in the press or who do some stuff on social media about it, they actually will look up and try to find the individuals in the system. And I think most of the time, the, the application is incomplete. It's not like they've just been put off to the side and they're not being processed. If the application is complete, you are being processed. So if you are in that late March period and you still haven't gotten paid, um, you know, call, look at your application, make sure that all the information's there. They're not gonna be able to process an application if there's not a social security number. I mean, that's just a given. The people who are in the queue, how many are in the queue now? A couple hundred thousand? So you have the queue, which is social security verification, which they're doing a lot quicker, out-of-state wages. And so the federal government requires the state to confirm that, yeah, you may be unemployed in Florida, but are you earning wages in a different state? Are you applying for unemployment in a different state? So that's just part of the statutory scheme that you got to follow. So you got to do that. There's also fraud detection where you go through and check uh, for fraudulent claims. And in a normal year, and I think th this stat is not going to hold up with what's happened with the pandemic, but if you go back in 2019, DEO will tell you that the majority of claims that are filed for unemployment uh, the folks are actually not eligible for unemployment. Now, a majority of the people that have applied since, I think for sure, are eligible, but you are going to have people who are not eligible. So that's why you would be stuck in the queue. Uh, uh, the, the, I think the Social Security number is going better, but you still have this interstate wage check, and you still have some of the fraud checks that are, that are having to be done. We're committed to, to continue to put as many hands on deck as we need to to be able to improve this even further. Uh, but I do want to thank the folks because uh, well, we're here in the governor's office seven days a week. They're working at DEO seven days a week. I mean, they haven't had a day off from this because they all understand this is important for the people of Florida, particularly folks who have, who have fallen on hard times because of this pandemic. And I think that there's a lot of um, a spirit within those employees to, to really you know, be there and, and help these folks. And so I think that's what's driven them. It's not been an easy situation. I hope we're going to get with, a, with the IG investigation. I hope we'll get some clarity on why the state would have spent all this money on this system when it clearly didn't have the capacity to handle, and not just this much, because this is unprecedented. Any system was going to have some problems. But if we had anything other than 3 or 4% unemployment, this system was going to be a problem. Even a mild recession, 
this would have been a problem. And so that's not a good use of taxpayer money. So if you, if you need help, we do have the call centers up and running. Uh, Connect is doing better. We have the PEGA application, and you can still do the written application if you want through Federal Express. So, so I'd advise people to take advantage of those options uh, if they're still needing to apply for reemployment assistance. And we're going to have some more announcements the rest of the week. We're looking at phase one. We're going to see how that's going. I think we've been very um, pleased with a lot of the data that we're seeing. If you look at the, we've increased testing, but you have a very low rate of positivity. Uh, we're down in the 4 or 5% range statewide. Even in places like Broward County and Palm Beach, they've now gone down. They're both about 10%. Just two weeks ago, Palm Beach was about 18% of all tests were coming back positive. Uh, that's gone down. Broward is now down about 10%. Miami has gone down, not as much, and they still have, um, you know, they still have some challenges. But then the rest of the state, uh, numbers are, are very low. Hospital capacity has been 40%, 50% this whole time. You will start to see more hospital capacity taken because of the elective procedures, but the executive order I did requires that they maintain adequate surge capacity if they do have an uptick in COVID patients. And so we, every hospital knows that w nobody knows exactly what's going to happen with this. And some of the other states that have gone for, you know, before we have, who went two weeks ago, you haven't seen big surges. So I'm hoping we don't see that here. But obviously, we've got a plan for whatever eventualities happen. So the hospitals are doing that. But, but by and large, We've had outstanding hospital capacity throughout this whole time, and uh, I know a lot of people work very hard for that. So uh, I'm happy to take some questions and uh, see how you go. Yep. Uh, looking at our Connect coverage from 2013, Deloitte testified that uh, there were approximately 12 to 1,500 specific requirements that Florida put into this system. Uh, do you, will that be part of the investigation? And as a second part of that, uh, Senator Roussan and others have called for Deloitte to be suspended from uh, any future state bids until this gets sorted out. Your thoughts there? So on the first part, yeah, I think everything needs to be looked at 100%. And in terms of Deloitte, uh, I, don't, I, need to, I, I need to discuss that, but, but obviously I, I would entertain that. Let's just put it that way from what we know. And of course, however this investigation turns out will we'll really depend on whether the state will do business uh, going forward. And the, the engineers I talked to were just... I think, I think some of them in the defense of this system would say, look, it is a complicated thing on employment. It's not as easy as just building like a campaign website or whatever people in office are used to. So, so it is complicated, but the way it was done uh, was, was not worth the amount of money that was put. And I just, I've not found a single person that said it's worth it. Do you want to you want to talk about some of that or? <laughs> I, can answer the question. I mean, a lot of it is just is just technical. So these are engineers who have now gone in and said, "Hey, this wasn't done. That wasn't done." So we'd have to get you with some of the engineers to to really go over some of the things that that, that should have been done there. Um, but that's part of what this investigation, I think, is all about. Even so, there's a lot of things that could have been done from the people I've talked to that this system would have still been very vulnerable to having uh, a big uptick in applications. Sheriff Tony in Broward County, please. How do you feel about the fact that he did not disclose the fact that he had killed someone, and what difference would it have made had you known those facts before you appointed him? Well, we did a background check, but it was a self-defense, so he was never charged with anything. So it wasn't anything that would show up. So how, how you would do that, I mean, I, I don't know. It's like if, if someone were to, were to punch me and I punch him back and the police said, you're self-defense, would that be something? I just goes, obviously, a fatality is different, but I think it seems like he was in a very rough neighborhood and uh, was trying to defend his family. So I don't think it would have, because it was self-defense, I don't think it would have made a difference, but it did not come up in the background check because he had never been charged or had ever had anything uh, show up on the record. You still have full confidence in his ability. So look, uh, my view was at the time, we needed to get someone there was going to work hard. You, know, you would know more than me from people down there. Uh, I'm not, it's not like he's my sheriff. I didn't even know the guy. It's not like he was a political ally of mine. I wasn't trying to do that. I was just trying to do someone that had done a good job. And I liked the fact that he had come from real tough upbringing. 
Florida State football and had been a great law enforcement officer, of course. So he's gone through a lot of background investigations up to this point as well. And, um, and it seemed like he had the leadership. And people have been very pleased. I mean, the people I talked to in Broward uh, have, been, have been pleased with what he's doing. But that's ultimately a decision that the people in Broward can make. It's not going to be anything I'm going to be getting involved in. So, Governor, people are going back to restaurants and stores right now. Absolutely. And here's the thing. Throughout this whole time, people have been going to Costco. They've been going to the grocery store. They've been doing, it's not like people have not been doing anything. So I think sitting particularly, we, we really want to promote outdoor because I think the data is very clear about the transmission being more, uh, more significant in indoor enclosed environments. You do that? Yeah. And here's, a, I think all these stores, all the restaurants, they're going to be focused on, on safety. Yes, I put in restrictions, and you've got to do this, but I think they're going to want to do a lot of that anyways, and I think they'll probably go over and above what, what we've uh, required because people do want to feel safe, and they're going to come out if they do feel safe. But I would absolutely go, and uh, I'd have no problem doing it. Now, I have, not been, I have not done a lot of shopping during this time period, and my wife has not just because we obviously have had our hands full, but I'd have no problem whatsoever uh, doing that right now. You know, people, especially in this area, Governor, are actually crossing the border to go to Thomasville, for example, <laughs> or to go as far north, north as Atlanta to get their hair cut. Um, uh, is what the governor of Georgia uh, and, and, and his plan uh, and the way it's been enacted, is that putting pressure on you to perhaps explore a broader reopening here in Florida? No, look, we, we I mean, obviously, the, the states that are closer to us are going are gonna to have more of an effect than if Wyoming does something. At the same time, I mean, there's no state that's impacted this area more, this state more than New York. Uh, I mean, they've, we've had tens of thousands of people f f flee New York and come here. Now, I quarantined and we did the isolation, but I mean, this is a massive number of people. I know there may be people in North Florida who are, who are going to Georgia, but here's what I know. I watch TV. I see some of these people telling, waving their fingers, saying, stay in their house don't do anything, and yet they manage to have haircuts. How does that happen? Is that just through osmosis that they get their haircuts? Of course not. So people are doing this to a certain extent, and, um, and that's just the reality of the situation. But I met with some of the folks. Uh, uh, we had a, a barbershop owner, some salon owners. I had May Mayor Demings, Orange County, had written me a letter uh, asking that we, we move forward with the barbershops. And what I said is, we need to get to yes. We've got to figure out how to do it. But we're working on kind of the basic safety requirements on that. But we also will look to see what the experience is in some of these other states. So I think Georgia, less putting pressure on me, but then being illuminating to see how things are going. They, they started this, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, I have not, now I don't study their numbers as much as I study Florida's, but I have not ascertained any spike, anything out of the ordinary with Georgia. So obviously we want to keep watching that, but that's a great, uh, great source of information for us to see. Georgia did this, Georgia did that, what ended up happening, and, um, and so that's how you, you use it. When, I, when we were doing stuff here at the beginning for Florida, I studied a lot of the data out of South Korea. I was studying what was happening in Northern Italy to try to see what the trends were, but also to identify why may some of the numbers have gone one way in one place and the others, and then trying to fashion our policy around that. But it was pretty clear to me from looking at that that this was a, a disease that was not going to impact the whole spectrum of the population. It was really focused on uh, more folks who, who were elderly and people that had the underlying conditions. And I think that that's been borne out across the country for sure, but certainly here in the state of Florida. So getting the information, getting experience, everyone wants to do it safely. Uh, but I was impressed by talking to these barbershop folks in the salon. They've already thought about things I wasn't even thinking about because they obviously have a, a responsibility and they want to keep their folks safe. And I was also able to ask the, the head of the Orange County Health Department, have we seen outbreaks that have been emanating from, from some of these places? And they didn't have any uh, examples of that in Central Florida, but I think that that's something that we can now ask questions about. We've seen, we've been it, in some type of mitigation for at least six weeks. What is causing spread and what is not? And I talked a little bit about the Duval County beaches. There was a lot of hubbub blue about that. 
There's not been any evidence. Obviously, the hot, everything's going down. And I'm not saying the beach is the reason, but clearly that did not spark an outbreak. And you've seen it in other parts of the state. Brevard County has had beach access the whole time. Uh, they have 600,000 people. They've had eight fatalities, very low numbers. And so we're getting a good sense of you know, what are the true high risk situations and what are some situations that, that, are, that, are, that are not high risk um, and really it's not based by science or data to say that they're high risk. Governor, Governor there's a in the unemployment legislation on the books is that the state can pay up to 23 weeks of unemployment but only if the unemployment is at 10.5 percent or greater based on a three-month average from the previous third quarter. That seems impossible to meet. Is that something you think needs to be looked at? Should the legislature look at that? Well, we'll see what happens. My hope would be that this is like a V downturn and that we bounce back. And so you're getting people relief now, but that we're going to be able to bring people back online uh, sooner than in a normal recession. That's, I think we should all work towards that, and I think that should be the goal. And, and if that doesn't happen, then obviously we can reevaluate. But I think we, when I've, done, when I've approached this situation, I did it with an eye towards uh, minimizing as much damage as I could, uh, especially in other parts of the state other than Southeast Florida, where they didn't really have significant uh, epidemics. We've kept a lot of things going, construction, we've accelerated road projects. The tourism is just going to be something that uh, once people have confidence and once we're ready, uh, we'll, 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 I think, can turn on. Um, that'll be a process as well. But I think a lot of the things in the economy, uh, you know, we've tried to keep going. So if you take away kind of our, our tourist stuff, uh, hopefully we're not in as big a hole as some of these other states and we can get back going um, a little quicker. Governor, so. there's, a March, there's a March 2019 audit I'm sure you've seen before where, uh, about the Connect system. Uh, it was noting numerous issues um, that had not been addressed. Um, obviously, we remember that a lot of these issues were like process flow, accuracy of the data coming in and out, were not being, uh, were not being fixed. How does this apply to the plans issue now with the system? And I guess why weren't these, why were these issues addressed before? before? Well, that's a question for uh, Ken Lawson. That was a, a report to Lawson. It was never anything that reached my desk. We never had anybody ask me for any funding uh, to do anything. The legislature never put in any additional funding uh, on that. And so I've read the report since it became fodder, uh, but it was not something that had ever reached my desk. The um, problems that we have, you talk to the engineers, are beyond what was in that. So those may have been good recommendations, uh, but I don't know that that is the reason why uh, we're dealing with the problems uh, that we're dealing now. I think these are, these are different problems. They're more significant problems, and obviously they're problems that a $77 million system uh, was not able to handle uh, off the bat. Anyone else? Anyone who's not asked the question? Yes, Governor, sir. Uh, part of the reason why you suspended the uh, the work search recertification requirement is because of the, the fact that nobody's really hiring. Uh, but that expires Saturday. Uh, reopening phase one's only going to be gone one week. Is that going to be enough time for people to really not need to come back? Yeah, no, we're, we're going to look at that, and, and it may not be. So, so we'll, we'll take a look. Part of it, too, is um, we wanted to keep people off the system because we understood the situation. The system probably can ha handle a little bit that a little bit better now. But, um, but, but yeah, I think we're going to look at that. I, we're we're going to, the phase one, it, it's going to be, it is slow. I don't know, we'll get reports about how things went today. But, you know, you're going to see slow, but I think it'll pick up momentum. And then if we continue going in a good direction, be able to move on these next phases. And then there is going to be a need to get people back in the saddle. So hopefully there are going to be uh, people, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be itching to go. I think that the, the mitigation, just from what I can tell, is people were all in to, to make sure everyone was safe. Uh, they wanted to flatten the curve, but I think people realize we have flattened the curve. I mean, the hospitals were half empty um, for most of this period. And so we've, we've preserved the hospital system. Uh, we know that the virus isn't going to go away. Uh, we know we're going to still have to contend with it. We're going to still have to social distance. We're going to have to protect the vulnerable populations. Uh, but I do think people feel that, that, that we need to take some steps. We need to be smart about it, safe about it. Uh, but um, kind of the first phase of this with flattening the curve, done. Now let's go forward. And then we're just going to have to follow the data, see what happens. And nobody really knows what's going to happen because nobody has ever, the country's not been through this. But I think some of the other states that have gone before us 
Uh, I think their trends have remained pretty good. And I think a lot of people are just naturally much more conscious about the types of situations they find themselves in. So, so there's a lot of, of uh, emphasis on, oh, ban this, restrict this. But most people understand the risks. They understand what they need to do to protect themselves. And I think most Floridians have taken action. I'll leave John here if you guys want to ask John any questions um, about, uh, about DEO. And then we're going to have some more announcements tomorrow. Thank you. John? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Senator, Mr. Senator, yeah, Mr. Senator um, people who call the Connect system tell us that they feel that they're being diverted to an out-of-state call center. I want to ask you, is DEO using out-of-state call centers to augment your, uh, your calling capability? We are not. You're not. Uh, okay. The mandate has been that every one of those call center operators are, are a Floridian. And my quick follow-up question. The governor said, I believe I heard him correctly, there are 900,000 claims in the system not processed. How long does it take to process 900,000 claims? So, so um, let me just look at the dashboard so that I have the right numbers right in front of me. So we've received about a million seven claims, and we've confirmed about a million fifty thousand. So as the governor indicated, when the original system, the Connect system, was having challenges, there was a second system uh, user interface that, that is, was utilized so that we could accept applications, and that system is still running up, running 24-7, 365, has had no problems. Uh, and then the, the agency offered to accept paper applications. What we think has happened is we've received duplicate and possibly triplicate applications. In addition, um, and this is the frustrating thing about paper, uh, is we've received a num large number of applications that are incomplete. So social security numbers not included. Uh, the, empl the employer's information. And without those, we have to take those out of the electronic queue and we have to process those manually. We can do about 10,000 a day manually, but it is a cumbersome effort when you have uh, that many in the queue. So we think there, that there's a large number of duplicates um, and that is the, the confirmed unique claim submitted, which is just over a million fifty thousand. Yes, Senator. Um, there's a question about um, the executive order for or the lack of executive order over people having to reapply and report. Yes. And there's a, like two hundred more than two hundred thousand people about to reapply. Why was that not waived? That is a federal requirement, uh -huh. and and we've looked at every way that we could get. Uh, we've talked to the Department of Labor about it. I've talked to the Assistant Secretary of Labor, and uh, that is something that we cannot get around, unfortunately. We'd like to, you know, my whole goal in this whole process has been to remove as much friction for Floridians as possible. That is one area where we've been a little challenged. Uh, and just a quick follow-up to that. I mean, that was something obviously you didn't knew was going to be coming. Why was it, I mean, announced weeks after the fact? Maybe we thought we could overcome it. I'm not sure. I've only been here two weeks, so I, I, I can only tell you what's happened really since I've been here. Hey, John, there are people who are, who are clearly eligible. Uh, they have submitted an application, uh, have given you all the information you've requested, but still find that they are being deemed ineligible by DEO. Uh, what ultimately is going to be done to make them whole? So, well, so for, certainly if someone is eligible for benefits, uh, they're going to receive those benefits for the time that they were unemployed through the day that their eligibility runs out. So that is a, a, a guarantee. Nobody's going to be out money if they're eligible and they're not. Uh, there are a number of instances, like I just referenced, where we don't have all the information. Maybe somebody put in their, their uh, employer's identification number and a number got transposed or they got in, inaccurate information. That's where we have to go back. And sometimes folks are ineligible. And that's where we have to go back and, and manually contact them. And so that's, that's the big lift that we've got right now. So if you're they're ineligible currently because they haven't provided the correct information, but they might not know that. Is that correct? What you're correct. And are they being notified of that? Of yes, we're, we're, we're doing as much notification as we can. Again, some, sometimes people don't give us an email address or um, perhaps we have a wrong phone number. With the volume of applications that we've received, uh, we're going to have a few errors. And, and it's not more than a few, it's thousands of errors where we've got to go back and, and do some cleanup. Mr. Secretary, one of the things that was blowing up some email boxes today was that some people got a couple of weeks of benefits and now it's stopped. And the question being raised is, have, has that two-week uh, re, re, recheck-in 
uh, really been waived or is the computer flagging people? Uh, it, it's, it's been waived. Uh, you know, I hadn't heard that. I'd have to check into those individual cases that you're referencing. I'll follow up with them. Okay. Good. If y'all have any follow-up questions, just give me a call. Okay. Thank you very much.